Welcome to the Occult London podcast. This is a new podcast dedicated to exploring magic, mysticism, and the Kabbalah, as well as other topics. If you like the podcast, please write a review and rate on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening to this on, as it will really help us to get this message out there. Also, be sure to visit our website at occultlondon.co.uk, where you can subscribe to the show. In today's episode, we are going to be continuing our discussion on the different signs of the Zodiac with a look at the sign of Libra and some of the magical and mystical elements of this particular energy. The position of Libra is between Virgo and Scorpio in the Zodiac and it is also the only sign of the Zodiac to represent a non-living object. So it's the scales. The constellation of Libra can be seen in the summer in the northern hemisphere and also in the winter in the southern hemisphere. However, it is notoriously difficult to see it as it is one of the very faint constellations. Some of the astrological dates associated with Libra are as follows. The solar conjunction, astronomical October 31st to November 21st. The Rashis, October the 18th to November the 16th. The Tropical Calendar, September the 24th to October the 23rd. The opposition is May the 8th. Uh, It's the House of Venus and the element that rules Libra is air. Some of the normal attributes of Libra are what you'd expect uh, with, with a particular symbol. So we have diplomacy, we've got justice, elegance, intellectual ability. Some of the colours that are associated with Libra are greens, pastel colours, elegant colours. And some of the incenses that would be associated are crisp incenses, airy incenses. So things like galbanum, galmastic, sandalwood would be really good. The angel of Libra is Zuriel. Libra is one of the constellations that has been known since ancient times. And whilst today it is known as the balance or the scales, in the past it had many other names, including Scorpius and also the Celli or the Claws. The brightest star in this constellation is called Zuben. Shalmali or Zuban el Shamali, and that's an Arabic name for Northern Claw. And the second brightest star is Zuban el Genubil or the Southern Claw. Apologies for my pronunciation. As we mentioned before, this is the only inanimate sign in the zodiac, however, originally it was represented by the figure of a man or a woman holding a pair of scales. Over time, however, the human divine figure was removed and the scales remained. And this is likely due to the fact that this zodiac sign um, comes from Arabic, where it was likely that any representation of a figure would have been forbidden. The origins of the sign are very obscure and you know the Greeks did not include it in their pantheon of signs. Greeks had 11 constellations, of which one was a double sign, which was Scorpius and Celli, the claws of the scorpion. The claws of the scorpion were then later turned into scales by the Romans, and legend has it that this was done by Julius Caesar's astrologer, Sosogenes, to essentially represent the scales of justice that would have been held by this mighty Roman emperor. Sosogenes of Alexandria, in case anyone doesn't know, was a Greek astronomer from Ptolemaic Egypt who, according to Pliny the Elder, was consulted by Julius Caesar on a number of occasions. Obviously the scales are important and they're meant to represent you know, this idea of duality, so it's the equality of day and night. Because at that time as well, it would have contained the autumn equinox. And we hear from Virgion in the Jordics book 
when Libra makes the hours of day and night equal and now dives the globe in the middle between light and shades. The Greek double sign Chelai, Claws the Scorpion, were also believed to be holding a censer or a lamp that symbolised the lamp of the eternal mysteries that would have been on altars. And the lamp can also be seen as being symbolic of the Pharos lighthouse, the great lamp or lighthouse of Alexandria that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's unlikely, according to research, that the Romans invented the scales. Um, The symbol of the scales is obviously very common in many different traditions, many different cultures, in Hebrew, Arabic, um, Assyrian and also the Egyptian. And the scales represent lots of different things in lots of different cultures. Um, But often they would represent the weighing of souls or the psychostasia, which was a religious motif in Christianity. Whereby essentially a person's life would have been assessed by weighing their soul or some part of them immediately after death. In order to judge their fate. If we look at the Dendera zodiac in Egypt, it features the scales. And this idea of weighing the souls of the dead in ancient Egypt was very important, and they would weigh them against the feather of truth or the feather of Mart holding the balance. In Babylonia, Libra was called Masathre. Persians called it Tarazuk. Christians also you see depictions of literal weighing of souls in Christianity. So the testament of Abraham. And also we see the Archangel Michael, who is one of the most empower- most important and well known of the archangels, but he's often shown weighing the souls of people on scales on judgment day. Also in Persian zodiacal figures, we see depictions of people weighing scales. So scales in one hand and a lamb in another. Um, And a lamb was a unit of weight in those days. And during the Middle Ages, the scales, or rather Scorpius, was also associated with the plague. So the scorpion rose in the evening twilight at the hottest time of the year, which was the time of disease and plague because obviously the germs would spread at that point and the symbol of the scorpion was meant to hold the scale of life and death in its claws and would weigh anyone who would live and who would die that season so it sort of decides what's going to happen the rising of Sagittarius would then drive this darkness this disease this plague away because of the time of year Libra is also associated with the harvest because in ancient times grains and crops would have been weighed on the scales when they were harvested. So scales also have another deeper symbolism. They are the scales of judgment for the dead where souls are weighed against the actions they did in their lives but they are also symbolic of balance, of justice, of harmony and of prosperity, of this this bountiful harvest. In ancient Egypt, the scales, as mentioned, were very much connected to this weighing of the souls, and they were connected to the Hall of Judgment and the 42 assessors, as well as Anubis. Anubis has the head of a jackal and guides the dead through the underworld. He is this figure that guides from one state to another, very much a psychopomp. He guides the dead through the underworld to make sure they are weighed fairly. And Anubis, from that perspective, is a real master of balance and scales. If we read the Egyptian Book of the Dead, specifically the Papyrus of Ani, we see a judgment steen depicted. Anubis is crouching beside a large scale. 
and he's weighing the heart of a dead person. And if in one hand, in one of the bowls, there rests the heart, and in the other bowl, truth sits depicted by a feather. Only when the heart is seen to be in balance with harmony with that divine truth represented by the feather can the person then pass into the afterlife. Those who were found to be pure in this ceremony would have been declared to be an Ankh or a transfigured spirit who is Mart Heru, true of voice, while those who were found to be wanted would have faced the second death, which is usually being fed to the demon Amit or thrown into a lake of fire. The Papyrus of Ani is an incredible book and it's really worth reading for anyone who has an interest in ancient Egyptian mythology and religion and magic. And it's got incredible language in it. I wanted to quote from The Coming Forth by Day. The Coming Forth by Day. The heart of Osiris has in very truth been weighed and his heart soul has borne testimony on his behalf. His heart has been found right by the trial in the great balance. There has not been found any wickedness in him. He has not wasted the offerings which have been made in the temples. He has not committed any evil act. And he has not set his mouth in motion with words of evil whilst he was upon the earth. The speech of Thoth. There is no sin in my body. I have not spoken that which is not true knowingly, nor have I done anything with a false heart. Grant you that I may be like those favoured ones who are in your following, and that I may be an Osiris, greatly favoured by the beautiful God and beloved of the Lord of the two lands. I am Ra, who stabilizes those who praise him. I am not of the God within the Asur tree, and my appearance is the appearance of Ra on this day. My hair is the hair of Nu, my face is the face of the disc, my eyes are the eyes of Hathor, my ears are the ears of Ubat. And that's a quote from the Book of Coming Forth by Day. Scales have also been very much connected with justice, truth and law. For example, we see examples of statues of justice often with as a woman blindfolded holding the scales of justice in her hands and obviously the scales in that representation are symbolic of impartiality so we, each person is judged according to their rightful due and throughout the world the scales of justice are also you know ever present symbols of these ideals and aspirations of the legal system they remind judges, they remind lawyers, solicitors, attorneys of the task before them. And each side of the scales of justice from that perspective can be seen as one side of a case before the court. Argument and evidence, the scales tip to one side or another depending on the truth that comes out and obviously the judge who holds the scales and has to make that decision is then responsible for for working out which side is more heavy and which argument represents the truth in ancient Greece as I said Greeks didn't really have a, a legend so much um, associated with Libra um, but the idea of justice was represented by the goddess Themis, who's the mother of Astraea. And Themis and her daughter Astraea are the constellations of Libra and Virgo, and they're meant to shine side by side. And the legend is that when the human race finally reaches its golden age, 
Themis, who symbolises this divine justice, and her daughter, who symbolises innocence, will return to Earth. So they're really representing this higher divine justice. So we're not talking about, you know, retribution and that type of thing. It's really this kind of divine divine justice that sits behind all, that divine truth represented by the feather of Mars. There's a beautiful Orphic hymn to Themis, which I wanted to read to you. Illustrious Themis of celestial birth, you I invoke, young blossom of the earth, beauteous eyed virgin from you alone. Prophetic oracles to humanity were known. Given from the deep recesses of the fane in sacred Pytho, where renowned you reign. From you, Apollo's oracle rose, and from you, power his inspiration flows. Honoured by all, of form divinely bright, majestic virgin wandering in the night, Humanity from you first learnt initial rites, and Dionysus nightly cowers, your soul delights. For holy honours to disclose is yours, and with all the culture of the powers divine, be present, goddess, to my prayer inclined, and bless the mystic rites with favouring mind. From a magical perspective, when we reach the time of Libra, we're in the autumn equinox and, you know, the night and day are in equilibrium almost. And as we've seen, Libra is represented by the symbol of the scales. And so in the same way, this energy is all about balance. This is a time of weighing, of looking at different aspects of ourselves the good, the bad, the ugly, and you know, working out which bits are working, which bits are not. So things like shadow work and you know, facing that darker side of ourselves is particularly relevant with this this kind of energy. As humans, often we will, um, you know, fall prone to identifying one side of ourselves and refusing to acknowledge the other, or also making excuses for the other even though you know it's not always you know the right thing to do so this is quite a good way of you know working that energy out trying to balance out those different aspects within myself yourself and also you know self analysis self knowledge you know facing those aspects and balancing them and incorporating them into your life setting that energy free it's also a really good energy to work out situations with friends that you might have fallen out with, family, where there's lots of different inputs and a decision needs to be made. Also, as this sign is ruled by Venus, it can work quite well from that point of view. Obviously, compassion, loving, giving and receiving um, to others, understanding other people's viewpoints, looking at something that you've thought you don't agree with but maybe weighing it up on the scales and thinking actually let's have a look at that decision you know why am I fighting against it obviously as magicians our goal is to balance all aspects of ourselves so this is a very good energy to work with as WH Auden said if equal affection cannot be let the more loving one be me. That's all we've got time for today. However, I'd like to finish the episode with a beautiful poem by Jane Hursfield called The Weighing. The heart's reasons seen clearly, even the hardest will carry its whip marks and sadness and must be forgiven. As the drought-starved Ellen forgives, the drought-starved lion who will finally take her. Enters willingly then, the life she cannot refuse, and his lion is fed and does not remember the other. 
so few grains of happiness, measured against all the dark, and still the scales balance. The world asks of us, only the strength we have and we give it, then it asks more, and we give it. Thanks very much for joining us this week on the Occult London podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please make sure to visit our website at occultlondon.co.uk where you can subscribe to the show. Thank you and good night.